Welcome to Six African Trade Talks, the show that brings you closer to the intra Africa trade business world. I'm your host, Chad Chawanda. In this episode, our guest is Neil Canada. Neil is an entrepreneur, investor, scientist, altruist, and author. Neil, welcome to Six African Trade Talks. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Before we start, we'd like to hear a word from our sponsors. Would you travel to Cape Town for business or leisure? What if you could combine the two? Well, you can. With Optimum African Experience, Cape Town Leisure Experience, with partners such as University of Cape Town, CEDA, Kadena, Luminary, and Prime Focus, experience the best of Africa. Neil, what is the one thing nobody knows about you? It could be a turning point or something major that turned the course of your life. So yeah, I think there's something that a lot of people don't know about me. I spent a lot of time as a wrestler. So I played football and wrestling in high school in St. Louis, Missouri. And having to go through the hard process of training for football, I'd have to you know gain 20 pounds for wrestling. I'd have to lose 20 pounds and just really putting in the effort to be a great athlete and you know wrestle over 100 matches in my career really did push a lot of how my discipline and work ethic comes from really wrestling. I'd give a lot of credit to it. Interesting. And I guess as an entrepreneur, that discipline is very, very key. So thank you very much for sharing. Sure. And it's a big thing, I think, with kids. I have two young kids, six and three now. And I think it's important for kids at that age to play as many different sports as possible and do as many activities because it changes the consistency of the practice and the diligence of getting better at a skill is just remarkable. And you can see it at that young age. Amazing. You're the first wrestler on our podcast. So Mm -hmm. uh, (laughs) thank you very much for sharing. Sure. Tell us more about yourself. As I said, I was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. My dad ran testing labs growing up. uh, And so I saw him as a scientist CEO. He quit his job as a scientist when I was two years old. And so I saw him start a one-person testing lab and grow that over many years. And so that really kind of impacted watching him build that business really kind of changed my life. And then actually seeing that business get taken from him. So in the 2008 recession, a business that he had been growing since 1990 from one person to, you know, 500 plus people, he lost that in the 2008 recession. He had two bad quarters and Bank of America took that business. And so while I was in college, he went from running a 500 person company to basically having nothing again. So right after college, when I graduated University of Michigan in 2010, he and I started a testing lab. And that testing lab grew to close to 100 people and was very successful. But the experience of being back in a lab, being back at the beginning with my dad, where he was just extremely patient and confident that he would still end up being successful, even though he had had such ups and downs in his life and in his career. The fact that, you know, at 55 years old in 2010, for him to just pick things up and just start another business. And I was 21 at the time. It gave me so much energy to see that he just never quit. And that really instilled a lot of the determination that I still drive on today. Such a core part of running startups is that the startup isn't over when it runs out of money. It's over when you quit. That brings some memories. 2008 was really a tough year. And I thought I had a tough time, but having to lose a business with 500 people and you're 55 years old, it's easy to lose hope. And your dad did well. So thank you very much for sharing. Why was Utopia Ventures created? So I started my first business with my dad. And so I was the founder and CEO and really ran that business for a few years. And then I had the idea for my second startup, Labdoor. Labdoor.com. And so if Avemean was done in a very bootstrapped way, Labdoor was done in a traditional Silicon Valley way where we raised money from angel investors led by Mark Cuban in our seed round. We went through Y Combinator in 2015. We raised our Series A led by Floodgate in 2016. We even moved to San Francisco from 2012 to 2018. We got that full experience. And so running companies two different ways 
both times I was the scientist CEO, but I ran both companies in different ways. I found that the structures in VC are very biased against the scientist CEO. We have these VC models where the investors almost acquire the intellectual property of scientists. They are scouting at different labs and they're looking for great new science. But when they find it, instead of investing in the scientists and helping them build a business around that science, what they do is they try to buy the science and then hire their own business people to run that science. And that's not actually how the biggest biotech companies in the last two decades have been created. They've been created by scientist CEOs, the Kersion and Twist and Ginkgo Bioworks and Solugen, some of these great biotech startups are all still run by their PhD scientist CEO. And so I wanted to create a venture capital fund that invested in scientist CEOs at the earliest stages. So that first $50,000 to $250,000 that a scientist needs to leave the lab and start a startup. And so that's really the phase that I want to be in is helping that scientist leave the lab, start the startup, and then do that for 10 companies a year, 10 founders a year, help them in that first year, raise what if it's their first million dollars, their first customer, really helping them scale that process so that they can raise Series A and go on to be really big companies. I think that I can, in this first fund, invest in 50 great biotech companies at the earliest stage and see some of them become massive successes in the next decade. Interesting. And what a good way to look at it, because from my own experience as an entrepreneur, you've got your vision and you've got your plans and you've got the way that you want to do it. And when money comes in, it sort of now wants to change the way you're looking at things. So it's quite interesting. And based on your experience so far with the scientists that you've worked with, what's their feel? How are they taking your approach? It's been exciting. I think the scientists out there right now are saying that there's a gap in funding between the grant funding. So if you're in the lab, you can actually go get grant funding, half a million dollars, million dollars, maybe from the US government. And there's a path to do that. But if you want to raise a few hundred thousand dollars to make a startup out of it, it's very hard to do that. And so that's the gap that is missing right now. It's this gap in the seed funding for biotech companies. And so I've been writing about that every day on LinkedIn, on Twitter. I write deeper essays on my website, neilthanadar.com. And when I'm writing all of these things, what I'm just hearing over and over and over again from scientists is there's not enough investors who are willing to write a small check in biotech. If you want a $10 million or $100 million check in biotech, that's actually more available because there are these billion dollar biotech funds that focus on the big biotech companies. But there's very few funds that are focused on the smallest, earliest stage biotech companies. And so I'm just hearing from scientists that we need more funds like this. And that's really what's motivating me to keep going. You know, what you're sharing in the biotech and scientist space resonates with what also even happens in Africa, where there are a lot of opportunities And the challenge is these opportunities require between 50,000 and probably 300,000. And no one is really willing to come in and back the founders because financiers, VCs, and anyone with money is saying, you know, it costs the same amount to work on a 50 to 250,000 or 300,000 project. It's the same time that you need to work on a 5 million or 100 million. So yeah, it's quite interesting. Which scientific research excites you the most right now? I think all of the biotech that is being changed and made cheaper and faster by software is really exciting right now. And so we're seeing more and more technology where the biotech proof of concept can actually be done on the computer, right? And so if you're able to simulate how your molecule is going to address a target, you can actually do that for that 50,000, 250,000 it's more likely that you can actually get to a proof of concept. And that's critical for my stage because previously 10 years or 20 years ago, a biotech company might've needed $5 million just to start up because it needed to build a lab and hire scientists and actually create the molecule in real life and then test it in real life against a target, right? And now you're actually doing all of that on a computer. And so that first stage 
has gotten maybe 10 times cheaper or more than it was 10 years ago. And now that that's possible, we can now have many more startups be created. Uh, I wrote a blog post like it's 1994 again, which basically says we're entering the dot-com era in biotech. And so if like we remember kind of Netscape in 1994, at that time, there were very few venture capital firms, very few startups being created because you know you needed $5 million or more to build all the servers and create all of the infrastructure needed to start a technology company. And now, you know, you just need a website and a laptop max, and you can actually be online and start a business. And that really changed is now instead of, you know, a hundred new tech companies being created every year, we have many thousands of tech companies being created every year, just because it's cheaper. And I think the same thing is going to happen in biotech where the next 10 or 20 years, we're going to start getting thousands of new biotech companies every year instead of hundreds. And that's also going to change our life. All those biotech companies are going to change how everything from our medicine to oil, to food, to plastics, everything is going to be created in a different way through biotech. You know, you spoke about the dot-com and being the early stage of biotech. Have the scientists been using a lot of AI tools or adopting it will become more and more prevalent. I've seen the first projects are coming out now because that's actually one of the most complex problems in science in general is there's a protein folding problem, for example, where you have to actually figure out not just the sequence of the amino acids or the genetics behind it, but actually what exact shape it'll fold into in real life. And so those types of things can be much more precisely simulated through AI. That's where I'm most excited about AI being created is kind of the creativity or the testing of millions of potential solutions. Because that's a challenge in chemistry or biology is, you know, there are millions or billions of potential solutions. And so it was just like old technology from even 10 years ago or five years ago, wasn't able to manage that much data and structure it in a way that was meaningful. And now you can actually ask the data questions essentially through AI and do massive amounts of testing in much less time. And so those are all factors that I think will make AI plus biotech a really exciting field. Interesting and exciting times ahead of us. Before we continue, we'd like to hear a word from our sponsors. IATF is an initiative that supports the implementation of the AFCFTA. It is organized by Afrexim Bank in collaboration with the African Union the AFCFTA Secretariat, marking an important step to sustainably address the gap in trade and market information for the successful realization of the AFCFTA objectives. Ms. Kanayo Awani, the Executive Vice President of Intra-African Trade Bank, Afrexim Bank, said a lack of access to trade and market information is one of the key reasons for the low level of intra-African trade. We hope to see you at the next IATF. So Neil, you invest between fifty and two hundred fifty thousand dollars in startups. Have you been in a situation where you wanted to blow the cap off and invest more? So I believe that'll happen more and more over time. So I think it's possible to raise larger funds later for a five million dollar first fund. If the second or third or fourth fund are bigger, I would love to invest not just at the pre-seeds round, but I'd also love to lead the seed and Series A round for some of these companies. And I think there's a lot of value in doing that whole process. That being said, I think the highest value in biotech is investing at the earliest stage. I think the first 50K to 250K check is a great investment in the sense that you're going to get the lowest valuation and the most equity out of it. But it's also from the founder's perspective, the time where they need the most help. And so if you write that first 50K to 250K check, I call it like a super angel where SV Angel, Ron Conway, for 25 years has really been doing this in Silicon Valley, where you know his fund will write that 50K to 250K check, but then they have all this advice and network built around it. I think Y Combinator is the same way, where it's not just money, it's the advice and network built around it. And the thing that's actually most exciting to me is this first stage where I can write the 50K to 250K check and then add the advice and network that I have. And that's actually most valuable to the founder and most valuable to me. Certainly. It's not always money that's important. Uh, social capital is also important. So definitely. 
what are the three positives that would make a scientist more likely to get funding from utopic ventures? Absolutely. I think a few things, the being a scientist CEO, being able to run both the science and the business side of it, I think is a huge positive. So I do think that the best scientific startups are led by scientific CEOs. And so I like to see that match as much as possible. I'd like to see the company having raised as little money as possible by the time they get to me. And so ideally, even if the company's raised no money, has kind of bootstrapped to where they are, maybe used grant funding to get to where they are, that's a huge positive for me. And then I think having a really specific big vision on where the company's going is really important to me. So I think the opposite of that would be kind of having a single ingredient or a single product that they're trying to sell as quickly as possible is harder for me to work with than someone who's building a platform for drug discovery or a platform for using AI in biotech. The larger platforms are definitely more positive for me. Thank you for sharing. Have you worked with scientists from Africa that are looking for funding? I have not worked with specifically scientists. So my first big angel investment, I invested in Paystack in 2016. And I met the founder Shola through Y Combinator. We were both a year apart in Y Combinator. So that was an excellent investment in Shola did, and Paystack did an amazing job with that exit. That's my first exposure to angel investing in Africa and was a huge positive. And so I do believe that biotech in Africa and scientist CEOs in Africa are going to be a huge positive and I'm looking for it. I think the nice thing about my strategy is that because it's so specific on scientist CEOs and on VC biotech, I can be very broad on geography. And so I can look anywhere in the world for those types of companies and still be very successful with my funding. Certainly. And yes, Paystack was a good investment for you, I can believe. And besides Paystack, have you traveled to Africa? Have you looked at anything that is not even in the space that you are in? Yeah, I think great funds could be created in multiple different categories. That's what I've been worked in a program called VC Lab, which is kind of like Y Combinator for VCs. And so I went through that program last year. And one of the things that they always recommend with VC is like there are so many different theses and they would all work. If there was a VC fund that was just focused on biotech in Africa, that'd be a great fund, right? If someone was just focused on SaaS in Africa, that'd be a great fund. I would love to see a big fund created around first check in Africa. The same kind of concept, write 50K to 250K first checks for the best startups every year in Africa. These are the types of funds that I would create. And this first check funds are the things that I think are most exciting because you really do change a founder and a startup's life by writing that first check. And so the more we can do that, especially in places like Africa, I would love to see that happen. And so, yeah, hopefully people like Shola and like, if as much as I can help, I would love to see more investment funds be created in Africa. Certainly. And that's also one of the reasons we've been sort of creating this podcast to try and help people get access to this knowledge and hear from people like you. So thank you very much for contributing. Any books or podcasts you'd like to recommend to our listeners? Yes, my absolute favorite right now is the Founders Podcast by David Senra. I love autobiographies, documentaries. I'm always studying what I call elite performers in any field. So as different from like the Tiger Woods documentary to the Hillary Clinton documentary to reading speeches of Theodore Roosevelt, right? Like I love all of these different study the best in any field and how they perform. And so the Founders podcast is an even more condensed way of doing that. And so he will take 10 plus hours to read an autobiography and then summarize it in one hour. So it's, you know, Henry Ford's autobiography or Coco Chanel's autobiography or Steve Jobs or Paul Graham's essays. And in one hour, you can basically study a great person's life. I drive a lot. I'm back and forth between Flint and Detroit, uh, where my family and my wife's family are. And so in that one hour drive between the two, you can basically take a person's whole life and learn from it. And I just love that experience. And I think it's a core part of how he has a quote, David, the founder's podcast host, 
has this quote, it's like studying the way athletes study game tape. And you study how the best athletes in the past do things to learn from the present. The same way we should be reading autobiographies and things like Founders Podcast as founders to be figuring out how do we become the best founders and investors of the next generation. You know what you're saying? It reminds me of the book, Think and Grow Rich, and how Napoleon Hill went in and interviewed quite a number of people. And it talks about different people. And then they even brought in, in edited versions, they even brought in other entrepreneurs of our time. And you see that all that stuff is quite similar, even though it's like 50, 70, 80 years later. So thank you very much for sharing. Would you travel to Cape Town for business or labor? What if you could combine the two? Well, you can. With Optimum African Experience, Cape Town Leisure Experience, with partners such as the University of Cape Town, CEDA, Medina, Luminary, and Crime Focus, experience the best of Africa. Africa is a continent full of potential, but potential means nothing if we don't take action to create value. Let us take action. Thank you for listening to this episode. Don't forget to post and share this episode on your social media platforms. It will help us reach our mission of sharing knowledge about intra-Africa trade and making it available to as many people as possible. Let us grow our continent. We can go far, fast, together. If you can please leave a review on our podcast page or on Apple Podcasts.